is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Cradle, Book Nine, Bloodline, Prologue, and Chapters One and Two. In these chapters, we have the trial for Sason. Station Daji, which uh, is real weird. We have Fury ascending. We have some more big dick energy from Lyndon. And I am just so excited to be here, everyone. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Andy for commissioning the entire book yet again. What's up, Andy? Really appreciate you. Um, So yeah, this is, I re-listened to the entire series uh, last month. I really thought that I'd given myself enough time to re-listen to the series and then come back on the like new book, like the timing would work out. But as per usual, I absolutely tore through them. So I just started to re-listen to Winter Steel one more time. And I'm about like two thirds of the way through it again. Um, And this morning I read Bloodline's first two chapters in prologue and then started to do my chores. And then I put on the audio book of the first two chapters in prologue and re-listened to it all over again because I need it. Inject it into my veins. I want it now. All of it. I am so mad that I had to stop at the end of chapter two, you guys. You don't even know how hard this is. <sighs> it's so hard. Okay. So. Let's start with the prologue. Surreal is back! Surreal, I'm sorry. You got some fucking work cut out for you. So... The whole thing that has been happening with the Abaddon has been slowly ramping up over the course of the books. We've been told that the Vroshir are a threat. Then we get to see the Vroshir be a bit of a threat. Then we get to see the stealing of the uh, the axe and scythe, scythe and all of the ways in which they are. What's the word I want? In cahoots with one another, the various types of Abaddon. But it really is growing clear that whether it's simply due to losing Osriel or whether there is another factor that we're not yet aware of, the Vroshir are a lot bolder and more organized. And they are coming at shit harder and Suriel is having some trouble keeping up. So... One thing that I want to mention, and I'll be doing this throughout the coverage of this book, just to give you guys some warning. I am startled during the re-listen at how well these books hold up to being combed through again. And that always for me is like the marker of something being well done is how much does it withstand the kind of analysis that a reread or rewatch would bring now that you know what's coming does that weaken the stories a little bit does it open up plot holes that should like should have caught your attention before and i will say that for me first of all there there is so much setup in the first couple of books that doesn't even begin to pay off until like book six, that I am truly impressed at Will White's patience in that regard. But as far as the Abaddon, it's really interesting to reread because we know more about what's going on with them now. 
The Abaddon, I found those pieces of the story so overwhelmingly alien and strange and full of terminology and rules that I didn't understand that for the most part, and I think this is evident if you listen to those episodes again, I kind of skated over it because I was just letting those pieces of plot wash over me without really trying too hard to actually understand because I had a sort of feeling that like I would begin to understand when I when I was able to understand and that this author was more interested in telling me what was happening than he was like holding my hand and leading me through exactly how everything worked. Now, I know that I have recommended this book to pretty much everybody or this book series. And I know that for some people, everything going on with the Abaddon is a little bit too much and they are feeling frustrated by the fact that they don't get it. And so I know of at least one person who kind of gave up because they felt like they just didn't understand. And I get that. I really do. But going back and rereading with the context of the rest of the books and understanding the role of the Abaddon, the way that other people see the Abaddon there, the variety that there is, because like there's a temptation of course, to think of all of the Abaddon as being like surreal. And it makes sense that we would feel that way because she's like the first one we ever see and the one we get to know the best, but it becomes very clear as we continue that the Abaddon are as, excuse me, I'm getting choked up. No, um, are as varied as people on earth are, you know? And uh, so anyway, I just, it's really interesting to get to this book after having reread the others and feeling like I have a little bit more understanding of what the point is of the Abaddon, but also why other people resent them so much. And it sort of feels almost like they have a sort of like a cab mentality, like regular human beings in cradle regarding the Abaddon, except that we know that Suriel genuinely is trying her best to like make things fair and preserve life. And, you know, so there are clearly some, I mean, we have, what is the name of the uh, Abaddon that comes down and presents them all with the, um, the arrow as the prize? Because he is one that just has this like attitude problem. He is really smug and extremely like condescending. He is the embodiment of like the worst. And I am so curious. So I'm going to bring up occasionally as we go through this mysteries that haven't actually been answered yet. Um, and, and the things that I'm super curious about and want to see solved, or even if I, I'm not eager for them to be wrapped up yet, I would just like to theorize about uh, Kieran of the Hounds. Thank you, Brain Case. All gods are pastors, says Austin. That does uh, ring true for me. Um, Andy says, Abaddon rat face. Yeah, that was the thing that was sort of the, leading me into my next point, because he is not gorgeous, right? And it, it's made clear to us that the Abaddon have a choice in whether or not they change their appearance. And Machiel, I believe, hasn't. He looks like how he looked and he hasn't made much in the way of changes. Whereas Suriel has perfected her appearance. I mean, show of hands, if you became an Abaddon, who out there would perfect their appearance? Hello, I would. Thanks. Are you kidding? Oh my God. Um, now, we have this memory issue in winter steel where w w what Lyndon is trying to do is show everybody his exact memory of Suriel and what she showed him so that he can get them all to understand that uh what's her face is actually a monarch of the uh the nine cloud court and the 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 memory is all fucked up 
Suriel doesn't look like how he remembers. When they go to the Nine Cloud Court, she's the one who says Shamiara, when in fact it had been like her presence on her shoulder that said Shamiara. And then when they go to see North Strider, it's like they're looking at him through the water when in fact he had been underwater with her. And he is really freaked out by the fact that these memories do not match what he in his mind actually sees. This is what Dross is projecting, and it is not actually accurate to his own mind. I am so curious about this, guys. This is the primary mystery that I have like at the forefront of my mind. No idea if it gets solved in this book. Don't tell me, obviously. No spoilers. But I have so many theories on it. Is Dross just not accurately portraying things because there's some in some way Dross is like falling short? Is it that what Mercy says is kind of cor- like, not correct, but it is it lines up with my next theory. Mercy says, weren't you just like a copper when you met her? I mean, how do you know your perception was correct? And he wasn't even a copper. He was a, he was still unsold. And so maybe what he saw of Surreal wasn't actually what she looked like, or maybe it felt like he was underwater when he wasn't. I don't think that that is it either, though. That doesn't really work for me. So then I was like, is it the fact that the everything is beginning to ramp up this whole opening of this book the prologue is surreal getting overwhelmed by the forces of the vrosheer fucking with the way can that affect linden's memories of her like i don't see why that would be so or why it would only apparently show when dross does something but not within linden's own mind i don't like There are a lot of possibilities here. I even thought maybe because Dross has been in contact with North Strider at that point. Is it possible that Dross is like being influenced perhaps by the training that he got from North Strider has interfered with his portrayal of the memory? Like, I don't know. Um, But anyway, so that is something that is on my mind and, I don't believe that Suriel showed up at all in Winter Steel. I think that was one of the bloopers is that she's asking at the end what she did wrong to not be in the book at all. So I was actually pretty pleased to see her in this prologue because I was sort of wondering what was going on. Um, Let's see. Austin says, my read at the time is that this is the way getting affected. Yeah, like, yeah, but it just, again, how? Um, Laura says, I figured it was one of the limits on how the Abaddon can interfere. She's only allowed certain actions to affect worlds, so maybe it's a security measure. Maybe, but I don't really know what that accomplishes, because she's still saying the words within the memory that she said to Lyndon. So it's the same, like, message. So that doesn't seem to, I, unless I'm misunderstanding what the security would be concerned with. Um Andy says, my take was the altered memory was an Abaddon security measure because memories can be read and she doesn't want unascended people to learn Abaddon tech. But what about Abaddon tech is being concealed there? I'm just, I don't, mm, I don't really know. Well, anyway, continue your conversation in the chat and I will uh, come back to you if I get the chance, guys. So, all right, let me continue on here. Um, she is watching uh, a planet that is basically like under siege and shit is really popping off badly here. It says, um, Abaddon attacked to seize the ship's lances of blue as they drew on the way to reinforce their attacks with absolute authority, but it was too late. Millions had died in the planetary barrage and the iteration's relationship to the way was weak. So she comes in. And she reverts the world towards order. A dozen Abaddon blinked back to life from where they had been struck down. A hundred others found their armor repaired, their minds restored, their weapons returned. The charred planet blossomed to blue and green once again, the dead population finding themselves whole and alive. Commandment's relation to the way strengthened again. So the Abaddon attacks punched through Vroshir defenses. So that's the name of this 
this iteration commandment, which is pretty wild. I really want to know how Will White decides on those. Um, and at this point, she jumps over to another iteration because they are also under attack, Jester. And she can sense this feeling of exultation and relief whenever she turns up after they have been calling for help. But it, which like, I'm sure must be satisfying and reassuring in its way. But there's also a sort of like regret and sadness to it because she feels their relief, but she knows that it's not exactly well placed. Um, so she goes up against the Silver Lords, platinum crowned men and women coordinating a barrage of attacks against Jester's primary planet. Positioned in orbit all around the globe, they unleash a synchronized bombardment, each attack entirely different from the others. One, a storm of razor sharp rose petals to scour a continent. Another sang a song that drifted all through that reality, eating away at opposing workings, which is dope. Yet a third summoned titanic spires of dense metal, hurling them into the planet. So she shows up, and as soon as she does, they begin to back up. And she acknowledges that this is not because they are afraid. It is because they know better two different things. And she begins to feel like she is stretched to her absolute minute limit. The instant she released her attention from commandment, the Rochier ships would reopen gateways to the void and escape with the captured population. But if she took an ounce of focus from Jester, the Silver Lords would crack the barrier like an egg. So what she decides to do is tell all of the Abaddon that are on commandment to allow the Vrosheer to get away, basically, and protect the people that are still remaining on the planet. But she has to cut her losses. And it's really rough to have to make these decisions. It's just her. They don't have enough judges. I'm, I'm not sure if that's because they don't find enough people who are worthy of becoming judges, if it's because they are suffering such like an attack from the Vrosheer that they are, have maybe some judges have been cut down. I don't know what it takes to kill a judge. Perhaps it is just because the Vrosheer, like I said, seem to be ramping up and better organized that they didn't ever need this many judges before. But regardless, shit is going left really badly and she just is feeling the strain of it, obviously. Um, and we hear that there is a saying among the judges, quote, there are always more silver lords. So evidently the silver lords are nothing to fuck with. And uh, they're going to be out here. They, like, I am seeing the, the silver lords in my head because that's my brain sort of tries to organize things. And I'm seeing the major figures that are like in heaven, for lack of a better description, in two different camps and we've got the Abaddon and then judges are like a subsection of Abaddon. And then we have the Vrosheer and the silver Lords are a subsection of the Vrosheer, if I'm not mistaken, right? Like they are working with Vrosheer. Um, so she manages to stop them, get them to leave. But it says from their perspective, she had just won two great victories, but she knew better. In her head, a distress call from a far-off world went silent. There was no longer anyone left to cry out. Ugh. That's, that's a gut punch, man. That really is. Like, I feel like the... This sort of reminded me a little bit of the discussion that Lyndon has with Charity about why Malice doesn't just step in regarding the Titan. Because Malice, as Charity says, lost a bunch of territories last time that she interfered. Yes, she stopped the Bleeding Phoenix, but she suffered a lot of losses and many people died. And there's like some sense that maybe it wasn't actually worth it. And that's sort of the responsibility that, like, it's, it's you know, on a much smaller scale. But it feels like what Malice is trying to 
do in terms of balancing entire populations and the fate of all of these people is similar to surreal, you know? Um, so yeah, there is just, uh, sorry guys, there is so much chit chat in the, uh, in the chat right now that I'm not able to keep up with all of it. Um, Laura says she could just be anyone if others see the memory. She could just be a monarch from their world. Only the holder of the memory can see her presence and her actual phys physical attributes. Uh, so I get like, okay, so brain cases, the memories were edited. Shaliala uh, was there instead of her daughter. And it talked about North Strider in past tense, implying he was dead, making sure no one could get any secrets out of Lyndon's brain. <clears throat> see, my issue here, though, is that this isn't being taken. This is being presented by Lyndon and he can freely talk about these things, whether or not it's shown in his memories. So I don't really understand what it accomplishes because, you know, he, he doesn't actually get to show them the correct memory, but then it's immediately followed up by Ethan. Who's like, yeah, I pretty much had a guess that it was Shamiala actually. And it turns out that a bunch of other people are already aware that it was Shamiala and North Strider is out here literally judging this contest. We all know he's alive. So what's the point now? It just feels like if they were security measures, they should be more adaptable to knowing that shit's like already out and common knowledge at this point and not, and the Abaddon aren't even like a secret. You know, they, everybody knows about the Abaddon. There's one visiting. So it's just, all of it is sort of weird to me that it feels like, what is, what is the saying? Um, closing the barn door after the cows get out kind of thing. It's just sort of, what's the, why make, why gaslight Linden when it's not actually accomplishing anything in any way? Everybody listening to Lyndon believes his version of his memories anyway. Um, and this also leads me to wonder about, because we have this whole thing with um, Athan, and he has a marble that he inherited, obviously, because he's like, a, perhaps a descendant of Osriel is like the suggestion. And he is able to show all of them this... Uh, memory from Osriel, it's not even a memory. It's like a presentation for lack of a better word. It's like Osriel left behind a Ted talk or something. And is that totally accurate then? Or is there something buried in there? Or is it different than what it looks like? Did Lyndon and Yaren and experience the same version of it that Ethan did? It just makes me feel like I can't trust anything about this now, you know? I'm assuming that it's accurate because that was meant to be, sh like, that was uh, meant to be seen by people. It was put there specifically to convey information versus a memory which is meant for that one human being. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, so, mm-mm-mm. -mm. Uh, Bring case says it's been mentioned that there are limits on how much the Abaddon can change fate before bad shit happens by keeping the memories and secret info contained. It would limit the butterfly effect. Um, Andy says, I think the memories were fixed. They didn't change according to what people knew or didn't know. Well, that's a bad system. That's a bad security system. Then it's just not good. I'm just going to say it. What's the point? You're not like, you're just making Lyndon feel like he's going crazy and it's just not doing anything. Um, anyway, so if that's what it is, I think it's silly. There, I said it. That If that turns out to be indeed all it is, is that it's a security measure, I'm going to have a, a bit of a problem with it because it doesn't matter. By the time Lyndon is able to show his memories to people and has Dross to do this for him, it's not really like gonna be any help. And I don't, I don't know. I just don't like it. Um, maybe if we find out that there was something else that could have gone wrong, but I just don't really see what the difference would have been. Um, anyway. Okay. So we're going to go to chapter one and mercy trying to baby pride who has no interest 
in her horseshit. Pride is practically completely healed, physically at least. And the thing is, Mercy is really the only character that has shared in her POVs the trauma she experienced from certain injuries, which I think is really interesting. It makes sense because of who Mercy is and how sensitive she is. But, you know, we have Lyndon and Yaren, and they have suffered all kinds of injuries. Lyndon has literally lost an arm. Like, they have gone through some shit. And yet, the only real trauma that we see Lyndon struggling to cope with he sort of, it winds up sort of going away eventually, is he begins to get a little claustrophobic in a few of the books because he keeps being fucking locked up by people who want to do shit with him. Other than that, he is able to move forward regardless of his injuries and what he has experienced. But it's, it's mercy who, during the Uncrowned tournament, she's really like wondering whether or not the protection granted by North Strider also heals the mental trauma from certain attacks. And it turns out that she really had a hard time after she was burned by, was it Safara that burned her? It was right. Safara burned her when they were outside of ghost water and she really had a difficult time with that. And she was relieved during the fight when she winds up back in her little like you know, preview room that a lot of the mental trauma of that attack is eased by North Strider's healing protection. So it's not just a physical thing. He is also helping protect their minds. And here pride is like arguing with her about the fact that he doesn't need to be babied. And it's clear physically that he is back to normal. Essentially. She even kind of admits that to herself um, but she says, Charity told you to rest, not to strain myself, Pride corrected. Straining myself is fighting to two overlords at once. His voice caught on that sentence, darker emotion bleeding through. Charity had emphasized that while his physical and spiritual wounds were gone, the mental and emotional consequences were difficult to determine. Coming from the Sage of the Silver Heart, that warning had sounded dire indeed. I am dying to know what this looks like. Because look, pride is on our side and all, but pride sucks. <laughs> like, you know, the one thing that he did that I was like, all right, you're winning me over a little, is giving Lyndon the diamond veins. Other than that, pride just can kick rocks like he's just such total asshole so i'm hopeful that maybe the trauma of these two overlords nearly crushing him in the palm of their hand like a ripe fruit will instill some humility in him and some understanding that he doesn't need to come at everything the way he does. He's so aggro. And for like no reason, he honestly has a lot in common with Daji. He's not as much of an idiot. And he has more of like self-awareness, at least in terms of the uh, reputation of his family than Daji does. But they both have like the similar, just, you know, that their egos are just in the way all the time. So I am going to hope that perhaps some of this trauma is going to help him develop as a person because that's what trauma can do. And that's not to say I'm not trying to like fetishize trauma because to a point, a lot of people try and be like, oh, well, everything makes you what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. Or we have like God doesn't give you more than you can handle all these kinds of sayings that try and act as if like trauma just is always an improving experience. And that's not fucking true at all. It can, if we are equipped with the tools to transmute the trauma into a learning experience. And if we are, at, uh, you know, have a capacity remaining emotionally to do that. But we don't always have those things. So trauma can sometimes just break you. And that happens. 
And that's not a sign of weakness. It's simply a sign that you were not afforded the tools that other people were, you know? So, um, let's see. Do, do, do. Ayantu says there was also that time when he gave him the crown in one of the rounds. True, Ayantu. And this is what I mean about pride, like keeping his family's reputation in mind. Pride is pretty practical, honestly. It's just that he has such a fucking attitude problem all the time. Um, Evil says Lyndon and pride disagree about how to do things, but pride is rarely wrong. I'm not going to agree with you on that. Pride has made uh, like re rereading pride made a couple of real bad calls. <laughs> so no, that's not true at all. Andy says pride is a good guy who makes sure to rub everyone the wrong way. Yeah. And I'm, I really wish the one thing that I'm a little bummed that we don't get to see is pride's reaction to Lyndon moving in with Yaren because he has been so certain this whole time that Lyndon's doing everything to try and impress mercy because he wants to marry her. And I just really want to know what pride like thought when he realized that it's Lyndon and Yaren actually not mercy. She's, you know, I wonder if there was anything that he rethought or if it's not like changed anything at all. You know, maybe it hasn't. Um, so anyway, this is when Fury turns up screaming because he still isn't used to like spatial travel the way that Charity does it. I guys, I could not stop laughing. I'm so sad that Fury has ascended. And I know that we'll probably still see him again. But he is like one of my very favorites. And I was laughing so hard at the idea of him just appearing, screaming his head off, especially considering that like his screams and he claps his hands at one point all inflict pain on people around him because he's a monarch now and his power is just ridiculous. And he has no fucking concept of it. Later on, him and Yaren do a high five with like power in their hands. And Somebody like collapses on the side of the room because they're not as advanced as everybody else. Can we just take a minute, guys, to just be considerate of the, our surroundings? Don't do that. Come on. Come on. You know, rude. I'm just saying. I understand. Enjoy your power, yada, yada, yada. Enjoy your power in a place where there are people who can handle it exclusively and not in this room where somebody is going to like faint. Just, 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 just you know? So, um, yeah, right. Ayantu says, I want to know why Mercy was being so opaque about the whole thing when she could have said we're just friends. I noticed that too, Ayantu. And I wasn't sure about that myself because there's that point where she's with pride and he starts to say, you know, if you want to marry into the family and she covers his mouth and goes, ha ha ha, good one. And it's like very awkward. And Lyndon is still not catching on to what the implication is here. And I also was like, why doesn't she just tell him? And I don't know. Is it because she thinks that he won't believe that she knows Lyndon enough? Like he'll maybe she will say that's not what's going on. And he'll be like, you don't understand. Of course, that's what he's after. He might just not believe her, but we don't actually see her attempt to tell him at all, which makes me wonder, like, does she have perhaps a little thing for Lyndon or she was just leaving the door open? But she's very encouraging of him and, and Yaren together. So I don't think so. Um, anyway, so the, this uh, moment with Fury, he tells them that they have captured Seishin Daji and Mercy has to sit in judgment of him. And I swear to God, you guys, I ended the last book and my fiance Owen, we were talking about it. And he was like, what the hell happened to Daji? Like, we don't see anything happen with him, do we? And I was like, no, we don't. We don't. You're right. I guess that's the next book. And he was like, well, I just want you to know, I don't like it. And I was like, okay, fair. But I am delighted that we just start this book off with this right away. So Uncle Fury also at this point tells Mercy and Pride that he is going to be ascending. And it's really wild because he just drops this on them and he's about to do it like that evening. He tells them that he doesn't really have a choice. 
this was always part of the plan. And he says something about how any having any more monarchs in cradle can be a bit of a problem, especially now. And pride asks, what does that mean? Mother will explain it to you. Fury's shoulders slumped and he gave a great heavy sigh. I wish I could, but I don't want to fight with her before I leave. Don't worry too much, though. It won't be too long before you join me yourself. And he says this to pride. And Mercy is aware that because she's supposed to take her mother's place as head of the family, she's not going to be able to ascend. She's going to spend the rest of her time in cradle. And she feels sad about it, even though she likes it there. And I understand that. It's just sort of, you want the choice, you know? It's not even about the fact that you would prefer to do the other thing. It's just that there's been an option completely closed off to you and not by your own choice, just by expectations of other people, which that's never a good feeling. And honestly, it's not that I don't think Mercy will be a good head of the family, but I do wish that she were being given more options. It's just nobody out there can come close, you know, like... So it makes sense. Um, so this is when Pride asks if his mother came to visit at all. She, he doesn't ask that exactly, but Fury and Mercy know what he was really asking. She did not. And she's also not going to be coming to the send off. And Mercy has a few like thoughts about this later on where she really is just kind of like, Wow. That is cold blooded. He's literally leaving almost as if he has died and she isn't seeing him or doing it. And she tries to give her mom the benefit of the doubt, but she really doesn't have a lot of hope that this is going to be that, that her mother actually is doing anything to indicate that she cares. And I'm really curious about that because I don't, you know, a lot of us don't have a good idea of what the deal is with monarchs and their abilities to communicate and the ways that they handle things and their contact with the Abaddon uh, on a regular basis. So for all we know, for Malice, this isn't even that big a deal. But, you know, Mercy is just, she struggles with her mother's withholding attitude, which she would. Um, so... Fury vanishes here. Her and Pride snark at each other again a little bit. And then we go to Linden, and he is with Yaren, and they are in their cloud ship trying to leave the city. And the Nine Cloud Soul is just like, look, look, I get it, but we can't. There's a lot going on. We don't have enough people to provide you with a portal. We can't let you out of here with a cloud ship. Shit is on lock right now. And Lyndon is getting very impatient because reminder, what's going on now with the Titan is literally the whole point of why he's been doing anything like for his, the, like the whole book, all of the books. That's what he has been getting ready to do is fight the fucking Titan. At least help his people fight. The Titan might be a little bit of a overblown, inaccurate statement, but you get it. And um, so I'm going to read this here. Dross popped onto Linden's shoulder, scowling with his one purple eye at the nine-colored flame that represented the nine-cloud soul. Don't listen to her. She was going to lock us up. I never said that, the soul corrected. I said that if you continue to sabotage court property, you would be punished to the extent of nine-cloud city law, but those circumstances were entirely different. We are now dealing with an unprecedented disaster, and at the time, you were acting well above your station. You did not have the status you have now. Dross's eyes narrowed. That's not what you said before. You said he spun into a twisted copy of the nine cloud soul, but his colors were duller and he was shrouded by a haze of oily smoke. He spoke in a version of the soul's voice, but he spat every word out in a vicious, spiteful tone. Lyndon Aurelius, if you don't stop, I will ruin you. I will hunt you down to the ends of the earth. I swear I will destroy you. And even if you become some kind of sage, I will never be satisfied until my vengeance shreds you to pieces. Dross's form shifted and he returned to his usual form of a round purple one-eyed creature. He stroked his bottom lip with one of his pseudopod arms and spoke in a normal voice. Yeah, that sounds about right. 
For a moment, the nine cloud soul was stunned speechless. Is that how you remember my words? I'd say I captured the core essence, the spirit of the message, you know, better than you did even, not to brag. Uh, I, for a second, I was like, oh my God, is like the memory corruption, was that just the first symptom of a bunch of memory corruption? Did Dross like get this wrong? Because he, and then I realized like, oh no, he's doing this on purpose to be spiteful. Okay. But I genuinely, guys, I got like a little freaked out because the, the corrupted memory has just been on my mind. So when he did this and the nine cloud soul was genuinely like, what the fuck? I was like, oh no, oh, there's more going on here. No, there's not more going on there. That's all that is. Um, so Lyndon's still in the midst of trying to argue with the nine cloud soul when a core charity shows up. And basically she tells Lyndon and Yaren, y'all are really, really valuable to us. Going to that valley is almost guaranteed to kill you. And we cannot spare you right now. Shit's going down. We need our high powers more than ever before. And we can't afford to just fucking throw you into a, a garbage disposal, basically, and hope for the best, you know? And she also says, now that we're losing my father, we cannot afford to stretch our resources any thinner. And everybody is like, wait, what? They don't realize that she means ascending. And think that maybe he's like, perhaps on the verge of death or something. But, you know, they she winds up telling them everything. And Lyndon is like, all right, look, I get it. And it really sucks. And I'm willing to comply with your wishes. But I need to take care of this first. And here we get our first glimpse of Lyndon finally really taking advantage of his position in a way that it has always previously felt as if he is sort of forced into doing it by the people around him. But this felt like a real bit of agency from him that we haven't seen often. So she says, there are reasons we don't enter that territory. And he finally just like makes eye contact and asks, what are the reasons? And they just stare each other down for a second before she finally caves and answers the question. I loved this, that he's just like, so you can tell me? Because there's no reason, to, like, I'm not a kid, okay? And I'm a, you're over here telling me I'm valuable? I must be valuable enough to fucking tell the truth. So how about you do us all a favor? Amen, London. And then, um, Yaren begins to, as she's listening to Charity's explanation of the way that like power is affected in this area she begins to realize that's what happened to her master it's clear that like Yaren didn't actually realize the extent of what was happening to her master and re-listening to the whole Adama POV opening from Wintersteel is it I was really excited about first of all when we f first went through it i loved getting to see his perspective at all because i was just willing to sort of let it go that a sage was defeated and like you know just figured okay this author didn't realize just how po high powered he was going to have sages be when he wrote it and that might still be true but if it is he retconned the hell out of it like a plus stands up to scrutiny it's fine and also, it gives us a great look at Adama and how incautious he was. And he had such power that his lack of caution paid off most of the time. He was able to get away with it because he was so strong that he almost always came out on top, even if there was a close call in the end. He didn't really have anything to worry about. But you really get to see in that section just how much he overestimated himself and underestimated not only the effects of the valley on him, but the effects of the poisons and everything that the cloud school, uh, what is, what are they called? Heaven's glory that they were like feeding him. He was so eager to keep up the certain appearance of strength that he quickly lost track of how much actual strength he was losing. 
And it's just really fascinating to see the difference between how he's handling it and how Orthos is handling it. You know, I am just hoping so hard that we get reunited with Orthos this book. Fingers crossed. I am assuming that's going to happen. I cannot wait. I miss Orthos so much. I really, really do. So, th- yeah, like I said, this is when Yaren realizes what that means. Um, and sorry, I'm, I lost my spot in the book here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, she, let's see. But, but, but. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm trying to find the spot where it's said and it's like jumping all over the place. I feel like something might be wrong with my um my my Kindle book here. Grr. Uh but yeah, anyway, Lyndon had not taken it he had not really like processed the significance of what Charity is telling him about the valley in conjunction with what Yaren went through. So it's not until Yaren is like, um, can you explain that again? That he realizes exactly what it is that Yaren has latched onto. And I really appreciated him saying that it felt like a slap in the face when he realized, because this is part of the feeling of him and Yaren being so completely solidly allied that everything that happens to her feels like it's happening to him too, in a way. I really appreciate it. Lyndon, you're a good partner, buddy. I'm just saying. So, um, Lyndon says there are people living in that field. Surely they're entitled to the protection of the Akura clan, or at least the Black Flame Empire. I don't wish to speak ill of your homeland, Charity said, but we only uh, allow them to remain because they aren't worth our time. They're like fleas living in an armory. We could sweep them out. We could sweep them out, but why bother? Lyndon felt a little guilty that he found Charity's perspective reasonable. <laughs> God damn, Lyndon. <laughs> Oof. Um, like, I get it, but also like, ew, yikes. So... Here's when he really just begins to swing his dick around because he's asking, have we, haven't we done enough? And she begins to interrupt and he says, apologies, but I wasn't finished. And I was like, oh, that is beautiful. There is nothing like calling somebody out on interrupting you. And I admit I can be an interrupter. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. I really don't. I definitely do it, though. I'm just a talker, you know, and it's like hard to hold back. And I loved this moment. And I loved that Charity, like you can sense her frustration and her trying to sort of like test him a little bit. But she also recognizes that he's in the right on this. And I am just, oh, I love it. I love it. So eventually she says that she will beg them. And she bows at the waist and says, please do not go yourselves. There is too much that may go wrong and humanity will be worse off for your deaths. Please stay here. This is when Mercy turns up and begs Charity to not hurt them. And eventually, Charity has this moment where she seems to be sort of like staring out and Lyndon's not sure what's going on in her head, if she's communicating with somebody or what. But she comes back to herself and tells him that she, he can get two dozen passenger cloud ships with a maximum capacity of 6,000 apiece, which I had thought the valley was much smaller than that. So I thought this would be plenty. I don't know. Um, but basically she's offering him a great deal of support, but there's a lot of sort of restrictions because of the power drain in that area so that these cloud ships can't actually get into the valley. They have to be left at the border and the people have to be sort of shepherded over there. And that if things begin to go badly, then they are going to be under orders to take off, even if the cloud ship is totally empty. There are all of these different, like, you know, these different restrictions. And she thinks as she's presenting this, that it's going to be, enough that Lyndon turns down her help and Lyndon's like are you kidding this is like more than I could ever have dreamed of of course I'll take this help 
So uh, that is the agreement that they come to. And I am extremely interested to see how this goes. Like this is a rescue mission that could take the entire book and I'm fine with it. Honestly, I, I'm fine with it. Like there's so much that can happen within all of that, you know? Um, so then we go to chapter two and everybody is telling me uh, there's about a million people in sacred Valley. That's way more than I thought. Okay, shit. Well, they will definitely have to take multiple trips then. Good luck. It's probably a lot of people aren't even going to want to leave. Like that's the tough thing with shit like that. People don't do what's best for them and they think they're being smart. Get your vaccinations, everybody. Uh, chapter two. The cold weight of Lyndon's winter steel badge hung against his chest as he stood witness in the trial. Oh, guys. So we've got Mira. We've got King Dakota. And we've got Dodgy. And they each are being kept under control in various ways. So D Dakota and Mira both have half silver cuffs around their wrists. And he has a um, sort of, does he have like a muzzle on him? I know that, uh, that Mira does. The entire lower half of her face, it was a contraption of metal and scripted leather. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I think he is. Daji is not wearing a muzzle. He just has a dirty rag stuffed into his mouth, which honestly, I just really felt that spiteful, dis like, it, I just, I loved it. And what's going on is basically these three are the sort of most important of the Satian Empire. Daji, we find out that like Linden's memories were viewed. So they know Daji is guilty. Like they've seen it. Of course, Dross could have fucked with those memories, but it seems like they're taking it on faith that Linden's telling the truth. However, they do have to grab the king and Mira because Mira is sort of Daji's like, she's been assigned to be his bodyguard in a way because just she has to now that his brother is dead and what else is she going to do? And the king is keeping her alive and the king is the king. So he is also going to be held responsible. But we know they didn't have anything to do with it. Like Mira has the good sense to never get involved with some bullshit like this. She has tried to tell Daji not to do stupid shit so many times. And King Takata, he's like, obviously, we saw the way that he was with Kiro. And there's a really good chance that Takata's an abusive father. Like, he seems like a pretty decent dude in as much as one can be and be a king. But there's a real vibe of like, violence under the surface when he gets in into it with Kiro at one point. And there's a, a real like emotionally abusive aspect to the way that he deals with Daji. And part of you feels like, well, maybe Daji is just a piece of shit and Dakota can see that and he can't keep the disdain away from him, his face and voice. But also you're the kid's parent. And like, if he sucks, then maybe that is a little bit on you, you know, like, you know, just saying. So all that said, we know that Dakota did not have anything to do with this. As it is revealed why they are here, which I found fascinating. Obviously, they've been arrested. But Dakota is only hearing about this assassination attempt for the first time at the trial. So he doesn't even know what the fuck he is being held for, I guess. Which, uh... That's terrifying. Ah, poor Dakota. In a lot of ways, I do feel bad for him, but like, ugh, this kid. So, what I love about this scene, first of all, we find out about how there is a bond when somebody swears to something. And we've known that this is a thing because we saw this happen with um, Jai Long and Jai Dai Show when he promised to like serve the clan. And he was forced to do, like, his body 
did shit without him because it was part of what he had promised. But for some reason, Mercy questions Mira first, has her promise not to lie. Mira agrees. And then says she wasn't involved, but she has a pretty good idea who probably was. And as she says, I warned you and warned you, King Dakota begins to freak out. So Mercy then goes to him to have him swear. But Dakota decides that he's going to try and take the blame all on himself because he clearly cannot handle the loss of another son. Like the idea of Daji being killed is too much for him. And to that I say, hey, Dakota, maybe you should have thought of that when you were being a cunt to your son. I'm just saying. Previous books, the way that Takata talked to Daji, Daji sucks, but Takata's attitude most definitely was part of what egged him on to continually try and prove himself because he wasn't getting any respect or approval from his father at all. And so he made rash, foolish decisions, hoping to get a scrap of, of validation. And Takata, you're responsible for that. And now this kid's going to be taken from you. It didn't have to be like this. And you're only realizing that you give a shit about the kid when he's about to be taken, executed, tortured, God fucking knows what. Sir, maybe be a better dad. I'm just saying, you know. So he tries to throw himself on the sword. And this leads to Mercy being angry in a way that we haven't really seen from her before. And I was so here for it. So she grabs him by the face, basically, by the muzzle and like lifts him into the air. Oh, my God. Mercy. I love it. I love seeing her push to her limit because we just don't get this from her, you know. And she says... What do you think is going to happen? That I'm going to punish you and let your son free? What about your kingdom? You think if you take the blame, everyone else goes home? I want you to go home. You understand me? That's what I want. I am not here for anyone who doesn't deserve it. Not even you. <sighs> Mercy. I love you so much, girl. I really do. So then she questions Daji. And this bitch swears to tell the truth. And then he just lies. And I can't tell what's going on. Lyndon asks, asks Dross how this is possible. And Dross has to assume that it's because of what's-his-face's interference, Reagan Shen. And maybe, or maybe, Daji is so deluded about his own motivations that he can almost make himself believe a thing. Like, you know, the way that people can sort of get around a lie detector test. I'm wondering if that's it. You know, if he gets himself to, like, believe his own bullshit, can he actually basically lie and get away with that? Um, I don't know. I just um, it's wild to me. And I really hated the fact that he was able to. So Daji gradually gets more confident and just asserts that this was really about him and Lyndon and their issues with one another. There was like a private rivalry and Mercy's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that, if that's how you want to play this, I don't think that's a good plan, but you know what? Okay. Yeah, sure. Private rivalry. I guess you two will have to fight now. And poor Dakota realizes before Daji does what the fuck is going on and starts to again, freak out because he's just like, this guy is going to absolutely flatten this kid. Are you kidding me? And he's not wrong. Daji, once he realizes what the fuck is up, begins to be like, oh, well, 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 I don't need to fight him. What do you mean? Too late. And we get like the most humiliating fight of this entire series. It's truly from start to finish. So embarrassing for Daji. So first of all, we've got... Mercy being like, 
well, we don't have, like, your armor was damaged and we don't have weapons for you. And Lyndon's like, oh, weapons? Do you need some weapons? I might have something for you. And opens up his fucking void key and takes out Dashi's swords. And it's like, how about these bitches? <laughs> and then Dashi attacks Lyndon and Lyndon just uses his, like, dome and cuts off all of the, like, techniques and everything. Grabs him by the ankle and just keeps wailing him into the floor. And every time that Daji tries to gather the Madra and to, to start a technique, Lyndon drains it out of him and then vents it back at him. Just a, so embarrassing. And, and Mercy is like, don't you want to arm yourself, Lyndon? And Lyndon's like, I'm exactly as armed as I need to be. <sighs> Listen, I keep talking about Lyndon's big dick energy. I'm going to keep talking about like, just get used to that, everybody, because that's what we're here for, right? This is the fun. Getting to see Lyndon stand there with his arms crossed, looking at this fucking weasel, being like, I don't need a weapon. I got my hands, bitch. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I'm as armed as I need to be. So it ends after he smashes this kid into the floor. Lyndon knelt beside him, speaking quietly. I tried to leave you alone. I know this was just you. Mira and your father, they're smarter than this. I don't think a monarch would have approached them. Am I right? You deserve to die. You know that. But they don't, do they? <sighs> so, they walk out of there, and Dross asks Lyndon, why didn't you just kill him? As they watch Dashi be dragged away. And Lyndon says, my name isn't Mercy. <sighs> Honestly, that line could have been incredibly corny. I think it's not because it's in his head. It's not said aloud. And that makes it so much more badass that there's no like, he's not posturing for anybody. He's literally just thinking that to himself. You know? Ugh. So I'm over time. But I've talked a, a, a lot about what happens here anyway. Um, because we go then to the Ascension party and we have Uncle Fury is going to be ascending along with like a bunch of family members. And we have a couple of things here. First, Mercy is sort of like struggling with saying goodbye to all these people. Even some of them she doesn't know very well. Secondly, she sees Lyndon and Yaren come in together and she has a little bit of a third wheel energy here. And it's not just the third wheel because of Lyndon and Yaren. It's because she has been elevated so f like high above everyone else ever since she was tapped to take her mother's place and inherit this book that nobody has ever felt comfortable or like been friendly with her in, in a way that didn't feel like it was laced with fear or feelings of being intimidated or whatever, you know, like, and I can imagine that being very lonely, especially considering how nice Mercy genuinely is. I'm sure she's made so much effort at making friends. And it's just probably she's been rebuffed a million times because people are afraid. And the Akura family is scary. So yeah. So I, I appreciated that she's watching them. And she just feels this sort of envy about the closeness that they have and a little bit of regret over the fact that like, as they grow closer together, She's going to be more and more on the outside there. And it's just a little difficult. Plus, they can eventually ascend and she's stuck here. Again, another bit of that. Um, and she has a moment with Lyndon where everybody's being super friendly to him. And he's like, well, I was, he says, I was worried that they were going to use me to get closer to Yaren, get revenge. They were going to blackmail me. And she's like, what? Why would you think that? And he has to be like, 
Because they've literally done all of that. She has to step back and be like, oh, shit. Yeah, I keep forgetting. My family is trash. You're right. You're right. I know you're right. Um, but yeah, I did. I appreciated the scene a lot. And I always like being inside Mercy's POV because she we get very little of her, really. And I find her a bit more of a mystery than everybody else. And um, then we have the... Uh, moment where Lyndon is given thanks by Grace's family for avenging her and they pay him. And it's like, you know, it's not as horrifying as I thought at first because they're going to ascend. So they won't need money anymore. So they're giving him their savings because like you literally can't take it with you. But or I'm assuming they don't need money. I don't know how it works up there. Hopefully capitalism isn't a thing in heaven. Jesus Christ. Um, But the the scene is just so sad, you guys. You know, Grace had so much potential. I really appreciate us knowing that as readers, like, and that Lyndon, like, takes this payment from them out of respect. You know, there's definitely a sense that he wouldn't do this, but he understands that this is their way of grieving in a way. And he's, like, trying to be as respectful of that as he can. Um, And then we have Fury telling everybody... I have no, I know I'm supposed to act like I'm really sad, but I'm actually super excited to go. And <laughs> he says later, everybody is like the last thing he says bef- before he opens this portal. And when he walks through, welcome to Threshold, adept, a dark skinned woman announced, though she didn't sound like she'd raised her voice. Her words echoed through the room. You take your first steps into the world beyond. Thanks, Uncle Fury said brightly. Let's go, everybody. And that is the end of the chapter. So I'm so excited, you guys. I'm way over time, as is tradition. I underread even. I stopped at 44 pages. I was trying to give myself time. Doesn't work. I always have too much to say. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for commissioning this. I appreciate you so much. I am just really so excited about it. And I don't know how many of you are aware, but another series by Will White has been commissioned also. Um, Elder Empire. Does that sound right? Yeah. Elder Empire. Uh, the first two books, I think, of Sea and Shadow and then of Shadow and Sea. Are they both? Is that right? It's like they're so close to the same title that I was like, come on, William, what are you doing? But anyway, those are going to be starting in, let's see, uh, July 27th. So we've got a little over a month before those begin. So just if you're interested in more Will White stuff, that's coming up. So keep an eye out. All right, guys, I have to wrap. Thank you again so much for hanging out with me. I will see you on Friday at the same time with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.